Hey, today we will look at something that I always found very interesting, patching or hacking Game Boy ROMs. And what better game to choose than Pokemon Red and Blue for the original Game Boy? It's probably one of the most modded Game Boy ROMs in existence, and there are ROM hacks spanning from relatively simple changes such as allowing you to catch all 151 Pokemon in a single save game, up to completely new storylines. Now, in this video, we will look at two ways of modifying Pokemon ROMs, the easy way and the hard way. Also, this video is part 3 of the Game Boy collaboration Life Overflow and Mia doing. A couple of days ago, he released a video on how to explore and modify Pokemon save games. In the unlikely case that you are subscribed to me but not to him, you definitely need to head over right now and watch and subscribe. Also, I've created a playlist with all of our Game Boy videos so far. It's linked above and in the description. We will start by patching Pokemon the hard way, manually without any external information. The nice thing about the hard way is that it applies not only to Pokemon, but to any Game Boy game in existence. The bad thing is that it can be a lot, a lot, a lot of work, but hey, I'm sure we'll manage. Let's start by finding something we actually want to patch. And while replaying the games, one thing bothered me a lot, the manual scrolling of text. Every time you get into a dialogue, you have to keep smashing the A button for the text to continue scrolling. Especially on an emulator, this gets old really quickly. So let's patch it and make it auto-scrolling. Let's start by loading the game into an emulator with debugging capabilities. Just like like Overflow, I'm also using the same boy emulator. But there are a lot of different ones out there you could use. We also need a tool to reverse engineer and patch the game. And luckily there's an extension called Ghidra Boy, made by Gekio, which adds Game Boy support to, into Ghidra. Perfect. Now, Gekio does not only build amazing tools, he also gave an absolutely brilliant talk at Obey 2018 on his Game Boy research. You definitely should check it out. So now that we have an emulator with a debugger and a reverse engineering and patching tool, let's get started. To start our investigation, let's get our game into the state which we want to patch, a scrolling dialog that waits for more input from us. Here I've just chosen the sign on a Pokemart. Now as you can see, all that is happening is that the arrow blinks and waits for a button press. Nothing else is going on, and so let's think about how we can figure out how to patch this. There are a couple of things we already know. We are in some kind of endless loop or in timer in which the joystick will be somehow red and the arrow blinks with a delay. And our goal is to make the game think that the button has been pressed so that it continues with the next line of text. So where do we start? We need to figure out where the buttons are red. On the Game Boy, peripherals such as the joystick and the buttons are mapped directly into memory. Check out my video on bare metal reverse engineering to learn more about this. The joystick peripheral is very simple and we can check the GPDEV wiki for details on how it works. It's a single byte mapped to the address FF00. To read out the state of the buttons, such as A, B, Start and Select, we need to set bit 5 of the peripheral. And after a short delay, we will see which buttons are pressed in the lower 4 bits. If we want to read out the state of the directional pad, we have to set bit 4, wait, and then read out the lower 4 bits again. So if we want to check whether button A is pressed, we have to set bit 5 to 1, then wait a couple of CPU cycles, and then check whether bit 0 is 0. This is important to note, the bit state is 0 when pressed and 1 when released. Ok, so how do we find the code where the button is read in the emulator? Simple. The debugger supports something called watch points. With watch points we can tell the debugger to halt game execution when a certain memory address is read, written or executed. So let's set a write watch point for FF00, the address of the joystick register. This will trigger whenever the game tries to read the joystick or the buttons. Let's continue the emulation, and nice, we almost immediately get a hit. Address 0165 seems to be trying to write to the joystick peripheral. One thing is strange though. The instruction we can see here is a load instruction, but instead of writing to the joypad address, marked here as IO joy P, it's reading from it, even though we set a write watch point. What's going on here? After a short investigation, it turns out that the watch points in Sameboy trigger after the program counter has already been incremented. And so we have to look at the previous instruction, for example using the disassemble command. And here's our write. Nice. Now this disassembler is useful, but not great for reverse engineering. So let's load Pokemon into Ghidra. After you've installed the extension, you can simply drag the Game Boy ROM into the project manager and start the code browser. And after analysis, we are in the middle of our Game Boy game. Sweet. Let's check out the address where the debugger halted. We can simply hit G, type 0165 and Ghidra will take us right to it. Now the first thing we can see in this function is a write to P1, aka our joystick register. To make this easier to read, let's rename P1 to joystick register. 
If we convert the value that is written into the joystick register to binary, we can see that it sets the fifth bit, the one that selects the buttons A, B, select and start to be read. And in the listing view, we can see that the read is executed multiple times. This is a common way to implement the wait after writing to the joystick register. We basically just read the register six times to waste some time. The result of the last read is then stored in a variable. As we know that we just read the buttons, let's call this variable just buttons. Next, we see the same procedure again, but this time with the fourth bit set. So this reads the directional pad. Finally, we see that both our directional result and the button result are inverted and combined into a single byte, with the buttons in the lower four bits and the directional pad in the upper four bits. This gives us a single byte for all buttons, with zero meaning a button is not pressed and one meaning a button is pressed. This is then stored in a global variable. Let's call it G joystick status. If we right click it and select show references, we can see that there is no reference to this global. Strange, as we know the game somehow checks the button status. Let's memorize the address of this variable and go back to the emulator and set a read watch point for it. And if we continue, we can see that there indeed is some code reading this global. And if we check the backtrace, we can see that it's read from the address 034002. But what does the 03 stand for? If you watched Live Overflow's video, you know that some cartridges support memory banks for RAM and ROM, which basically allows the game to access more memory than could be addressed by 16 bits. For ROM, this is done by switching out the memory between 0x4000 and 0x8000. And the 3 you just saw just tells us that this address is on bank 3 of the ROM. So to check out this address in Ghidra, we need to tell it that we want to go to address 4000 but in memory bank 3. Gekio's loader creates separate overlay memory blocks to handle this, and bank 3 will be called ROM3. We can go to an address in ROM3 by hitting G and typing ROM3 colon colon 4000. Now you can see that Ghidra did not figure out that this is actually code, so we have to go to address 4000 and hit D to start the disassembler manually. Unfortunately though, we are still missing references to this code. So let's check out the backtrace and go to the earliest entry, which is 5D57 in ROM1, and hit D. But if we go back, there is still no reference to our ROM3 function. Let's check the caller function, and we can see that the call to 4000 is marked in red. This is because Ghidra just sees a call to the address 4000, but does not know in which memory block. If we hit R, we can edit the references of the instruction. And here we can simply set the destination memory block to ROM3 and done. Now all our references are fixed. Perfect. Now we know that we probably want to find a loop, so let's just traverse up the backtrace from the point where the joystick global is read to see whether we find something that looks like a loop. Maybe we get lucky. The code we are currently looking at seems to be the code that selects bank 3 and then jumps there. So let's traverse further up the backtrace. Here we can't find any loop, so let's again go up one more call. Now this looks interesting. A loop in which the code path towards the joystick read is called. Now we could try to reverse this function, or we could just try to patch it and see if it behaves as we want. Let's see what happens when we just make this function return immediately upon being called. To do this, we can right-click the first instruction in the function and hit patch instruction. We click away the warning that this assembler is not tested, and then we can simply remove the parameters and replace the mnemonic with a simple RET, a return. Now, how do we export a working modified Game Boy ROM from Ghidra? You might be tempted to try the file export program functionality. Unfortunately, it will not work in most cases. The export program function simply exports all memory blocks in the order they are listed into a binary which will not create a valid Game Boy ROM. To fix this, I've created a tiny script that will export a valid Game Boy ROM. Let's export our ROM and open it in same boy. Let's start a new game and see. And nice, we have an auto-scrolling Professor Oak. We just made our first ROM hack. Awesome. Now, this is a very time-intensive process for making larger changes to the ROM. You have to reverse engineer for days and days until you are able to make larger changes to it. But it turns out that for Pokemon, you don't have to. Some awesome people reverse engineered the entire Pokemon Red and Blue and Yellow and Gold, Crystal, Pinball, TCG, Ruby, Fire Red and Emerald and created beautifully annotated assembly files. They even made all the tiles into PNGs that you can simply edit and that will be converted into the right format automatically. And the best part is, if you run Make, you get a Game Boy ROM that is bit for bit identical to the original ROM. Amazing. With this, we can easily modify Pokemon ROMs, from changing small things up to creating entirely new towns and stories. And there are even nice tools such as Polished Map, which allows you to load and edit the maps graphically. 
I use this to implement a famous Pokemon rumor for April Fools. There is this rumor that if you swim next to the SSN and use strength on the truck, a Mew will appear. Using Pokeret, this is implemented quite quickly. First, we need to edit the tile collision for Vermilion Dock, which contains the list of tiles that Ash can walk over. If we add 5.8 and 3C, which are the tile IDs for the truck according to Polished Map, we can walk over the truck. Easy. Now we need to create an encounter with Mew on the truck. For each region, there is basically a list of Pokemons you can encounter. Normally for cities and also for the dock, this is set to no Pokemons. However, based on a different encounter file, we can create our own with just Mew. Then we just need to edit into wildmons.asm and replace the no mons entry for the million dogs. But one more problem. We also need to patch the encounter code. There are three possibilities for encounters. If we are in a forest, encounters get triggered on grass tiles only. And if we are indoor, encounters get triggered on any walkable tile. As the vermilion dogs count as indoors, we have to patch the check to always assume we are in a forest. We also have to change the tile that the game assumes to be grass to be the cabin of the truck. Again, we can get this ID from polished map. In future videos, we will take a deeper look at how these tiles work, as they are quite important to some of the famous Pokemon glitches. Finally, we also patch out the random chance of encounters, so that we always have an encounter on the truck cabin. As you can see, if we now walk over the truck, it will always trigger an encounter with Mew. To finish things on the assembly side, we put a boulder right on top of the truck cabin, so that there is something to use strength on. This is done in the map objects of a million dogs, and once we've added the boulder, we are almost done. It works just like in the rumor. You walk up to the truck, use strength, and then Mew appears. Now we just need to adjust the sprites so that it looks good. So we edit the boulder sprite to look like the truck cabin and change the truck cabin to look like a Pokeball. Let's give it a try. We walk up to the truck, use strength, and what's that? A Pokeball. And when we walk on it, something happens. Oh wow, it's Mew. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed this video and also check out the other Game Boy videos from Life Overflow and me. You can find them linked above and in the description. Also, if you are interested to learn more about reverse engineering things with Ghidra, check out my firmware reverse engineering with Ghidra online training at advancedsecurity.training. Thank you and see you on this channel again soon.